Uh, welcome. Good day to uh, all of you. Um, I'm Steve Heibrex, so CEO of TPA. I'm here with Robert Vries, uh, who is um, a partner at, and, and founding father of Ex Nidio. He's, uh, he's involved in a lot of operational um, transfer pricing and tax with uh, SASV as one of his major tools. And Daniel van der Linden of the uh, eBride team, a sister company of TPA, is, uh, is, is on the line as well as another speaker. Uh, today, our, our topic will be SAS via the connector between source tier and tax relevant data. And we uh, would like to give you some pointers on, on the practicality of, uh, of that uh, difficult process, how to get data uh, from source tiers uh, to the relevant um, uh, digital mailbox with the tax authorities or in case of tax risks, uh, the, the appropriate dashboard to communicate those risks to various audiences being audit committee, um, C-level and, and CFO. Um, with that, let's move to the first slide. So we, we've been investigating what a 2021 standard software configuration for tax professionals means. Uh, and we, we say there's, there's going to be a layer of softwares uh, delivering an integrated workspot solution. At this stage, there's not one shoe fits all. Uh, each of those building blocks, as we call it, or Lego for tax components need to be connectable. So they need to fit on top of each other. Um, they need to be compatible with your process and communication software, being it Office 365 or Google Suite. And, and cloud native, obviously, is a, is a requirement. And, and the cost of uh, and combination of these software packages need to be affordable. I think that's one of the biggest worries uh, that we, we encounter at CFO level and the head of tax level, that if you buy 20 tax technology software uh, packages uh, and all of them deliver just uh, a, a siloed solution and all of them cost uh, 20k a year as a license uh, you, you're already spending 400k and 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 what do you get back uh, from that so the the demand from tax professionals uh and, and, and especially the challenges they are faced with, uh, we, uh, we have highlighted a few of those while talking to the marketplace and then getting the input from in-house people uh, like yourself. We, we uh, like to organize this webinar a little bit more interactive. So uh, which issues can you relate to uh, most is, is our first question. So if uh, you're on the screen, uh, selecting one of these, uh, well, we say, okay, the, the, your, your biggest challenge is as a tax person is to team up with your finance and IT colleagues, which ultimately defines how well and uh, how well you're doing and successful you are on, on getting your digital transformation for tax organized. Second uh, choice, uh, can you keep up with all the digital tax filings tax authorities throw at you uh, to the left and to the right? Uh, or are you constantly worried about compliance uh, deadlines? Uh, what is what is it the statement you most uh, you mostly relate to uh, out of these three? So please make your choice, and then we can see on the screen what uh, what the result is. So A was the most favorite one. Yeah, yeah. by by far. I, I I think that's sort of in line with uh, with what we encounter. That um, a, a lot of a lot of finance teams are are organized uh, in such a lean and mean way that they don't have time for tax uh, the, the the tax specifics. Uh, IT is, uh, is is overburdened with a lot of projects. So how do you how do you mo mobilize and, and inspire and motivate your, your finance and IT colleagues to, to work together with you on a digital transformation of tax. Uh, so I, I think that's almost uh, redefining what is, the, uh, what is the success factor to go into digital transformation is heavily dependent on finance and IT colleagues. Uh, one, one of my clients has, has 
uh, seeing uh, the finance capacity shrink to a minimum if if uh, any capacity at all same with their IT colleagues so they've been following the line of defining work processes uh, and and throwing in uh, a, a, a special a special application through Alteryx or other but B, BI tools like uh, SaaS via uh, to uh, still help the, uh, the the tax team uh, pretty much um, not isolated away from finance and IT, but at least not dependent on. Okay, uh, very interesting. Sh shall we move on? Um, th this is a, a, uh, a, a winding road and for a reason. We call it the tax technology journey. Uh, it, it is um, a, uh, uh, an illustration where you can read through what that tax technology journey means to you. So are you following the user experience days on, on how to work as a tax professional in the future? Are you looking at different playbooks, perform data analytics? Uh, there's quite a few um, videos behind uh, each of these clicks, uh, the, the use uh, of building blocks for tax, the Lego for tax uh, is is one of the series uh, we are, we're running today. Um, very shortly, there will be a white paper on the future of uh, tax in 2025, and and we uh, so far haven't been able to share with you that uh, 20 uh, top 25 challenges for in-house tax workflows. But I assure you, before the end of the hour, you uh, will get uh, a peek view of that uh, checklist. Um, this is all clickable, so you can spend 30 seconds on it, uh, but you can also uh, take three and a half hours to train yourself on all these uh, concepts, uh, depending on, on your interest. With that, let's move to the next slide. Uh, and this is sort of saying, okay, you, you get data from uh, SAP, you get data from an HR uh, set of records. Uh, we call that the source tier. There's connector tiers, storage tiers, processing tiers, and reporting and access tiers. And, and reporting could be to tax authorities and access tiers could also be dashboards to uh, your colleagues. Uh, the Data is managed through the different tiers, and the, and the big question is always if you start injecting or creating data at the source tier, how valid and how solid, and how uh, in in terms of integrity of data, in terms of data quality and architecture, have you organized yourself? Uh, so this is uh, the heart of the matter where SaaS via uh, is 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 focused on. Uh, it connects the data as it, it indicates here, it transforms it and provides the information through extraction in different formats. So it's a very visual approach, uh, which, uh, which we will show you in, in a minute. Okay, th th this is the from source to dashboard uh, and, and the why. Well, the why is, I think, clear that a lot of people deal with data coming from a different department and different layer than when where they are sitting and have access to and that is uh, kind of challenging especially for for in-house tax people shall we move to the next slide robert can i can i ask you to take the floor here on the, on the on the different building blocks uh, now visualized slightly different, uh, starting, I guess, from the left and then moving to the right and back back again? <clears throat> of course. Uh, so when we look at this uh, process, I think uh, most companies will work in the same way. Uh, is that if we look, we have uh, one ERP system, and what I see quite a lot is we have different ERP systems. We have, uh, for example, production systems, but uh, also system for HR uh, and other. Uh, we store it on different databases. We can store it in a data warehouse. That is, uh, of course, in most cases, is uh, structured data. However, it is not standardized. Um, it is not cleansed. It's not accurate. It is not complete. To really start to use it, uh, the first step 
what we should have is to really have the data creation process. That is really uh, in simple, we make a connection to the structured data and we make sure that we enrich the data, we standardize the data. For example, uh, we have uh, a country named Germany, we can uh, write it as Germany, we can write it as Deutschland. That is what we are going to standardize. We are ensuring that we make it ready to be used in the tax mode, the tax uh, engine. So ensuring that all the data that the tax motor needs is available, nothing more, nothing less. The tax motor has two purposes. One purpose is uh, to generate the tax reports to make sure that we uh, do the filing. Other purpose is of course to see if we are in control tax wise, uh, what is the risk that we have? Uh, do we need to take any action? That all comes together with uh, compliance. It all comes together with making sure, hey, uh, that we can see on a re near real time basis where do we stand? Uh, do we comply? Uh, do we file uh, our returns accurately and complete? So, if we have sent a tax report uh, or tax filing to the tax uh, authorities, we get a message back. That message is what will show in our uh, compliance tracker. We know that we are compliant. And it will also uh, show in our ERP system, hey, my VAT return has been sent. So this is more a really uh, simple view how you can be in uh, control and how you can really limit uh, the human interaction in this process. Yeah, another way uh, we we uh, typically, uh, Robert, um, in indicate to it if you have uh, data at, Sears, at, at, uh, at source tier, uh, then you need to get that data uh, struct from a fragmented, uh, um, un unstructured uh, set of data into a, a structured data set, which uh, fills tax forms, which gets XML converted and, and is thrown into the digital mailbox with the tax authorities. Well, reverse that process. Uh, and and if, if, if you, uh, uh, apply that process the collection of data you're doing is in today's world happening a lot through a siloed approach so you collect data for VAT purposes you collect data for transfer pricing purposes you collect data for corporate income tax purposes well the fact that a lot of companies still collect it in a very siloed approach per output uh, is obviously not very helpful and very inefficient. Uh, it's it's almost like uh, what a, it's almost putting um, uh, your your uh, um, uh, what is it you, your data collection engine on each time you have to push out a, a tax report and that's not a very efficient data architecture you should be considering. Okay, I think we could move to the next slide. So what uh, we also discussed on the previous slide is uh, that we need to get from uh, data without any value to uh, in information uh, to let's say the status where we can uh, submit our filings. Uh, what I use for that is uh, Stasphere. And that is really to uh, ensure that I can connect to any data source, uh, to any location, uh, so that can be on-premise, uh, that can be uh, on online. Uh, it can be, uh, what we also just discussed, is that we can see that we need to retrieve data from different sources. Uh, that's what you see quite a lot uh, within multinational enterprises. We need to combine it, uh, but we really need to be sure that what we submit, uh, submit is accurate. That is what we are doing within uh, SASFIA is on one hand, we have the data, we cleanse it, uh, we make it uh, uh, available, we standardize. We have the complete data curation process. Next step is course, uh, is that we have our uh, checks in place. For example, in SAP, I can have uh, my sales, but when I look in a different table with all my RVs, that can show that I have a different sales amount. 
So that can mean that I can have a non-compliance and that is what I need to have resolved uh, before submitting my return to the tax uh, authorities. And that is all what we can do uh, within SAS, making sure that we retrieve the data, that we uh, transform it into valuable data, which you can also use for other purposes, but that you are also in control uh, that you are absolutely sure that what you submit is uh, complete, accurate, and in time. So how does that work, uh, Robert? Uh, and if, if you have one data set, uh, say you have a, a value of a product you sold to a client uh, and, and you bought that product from a group company, uh, how uh, th that means I have two data cells. How would uh, SaaS via uh, sort of cross-check those two data points to make sure they're accurate. So what we uh, do is that we make sure that we can connect to all the da data sources. Of course, the most simple is when we have a multinational uh, enterprise uh, and where all the legal uh, entities are uh, within the same uh, environment. But for this case, uh, we talk about we have two different ERP systems. Uh, I know that company A sends an invoice to company B. What SAS is doing, uh, we have the two data sets and uh, SAS will look for any um, common fields. For example, in this case, when I'm sending an invoice that generates an invoice num number from the selling entity, the buying entity will receive that invoice, post that invoice, but also with uh, include the invoice number from company A. So I don't have to determine myself what can be the linking pin between those two data sets. That is what SAS will find for me. And that is also the basis where I can connect my complete value, value chain, supply chain uh, from the two companies together. Okay. Very good. So basically the data sets are being cross-referenced to other sources to validate um, what is the correct number. Uh, is there uh, a possibility <coughs> in, in SAS <coughs> to uh, have once you have one data cell being checked against three sources uh, and there's conflicting information, uh, would, would SAS be able to offer you a dashboard with a manual override so you as a human being step in and, and define because the three sources give a value of 100 to 102 and 104 and only the human knows what uh, the, the the right value should be uh yes of course we can do it in uh two ways and i'm always uh, fond of uh not adjusting it myself so we can uh, uh let's code ourselves in uh Sophia. so when there is a difference uh then we can automatically generate a re report when the report is generated, the user will receive an email, hey, the report has been updated and you can include any comment you would uh, you want. You can even set reminders. But of course, what you can also do, hey, if I have a uh, difference of, for example, 3%, uh, I can make an action that it automatically will adjust it in uh, a different da data set. So I can write, or let's say put any rules in place um, where let's say SAS via with machine le learning is making sure, hey, I see the difference, I will adjust it. I will inform the user or determine, hey, this difference is too big. I will generate a report that I will send to the user as defined uh, in let's say the list with responsibilities. So that, that would mean you can do an uh, end of period uh, true up uh, mechanism uh, either automated or through the generation of a report where the human intelligence needs to step in either way uh, whatever the the preferred approaches yeah and most important uh, on that part is uh, that we do not use uh, Sophia as a black box so it is not that we see uh, data going in and information co coming out you can see the full audit trail uh, which steps has been taking, uh, what went wrong, what uh, went okay. 
So also giving you way more uh, insight or uh, enabling you to do root cause analysis uh, if you see an uh, issue, making it way more easy to solve it. So explaining um, why we are working with uh, Sasvia. So what we see right now, uh, that companies tend uh, to increase the number of uh, software in place. So we don't have uh, one general tool that can do everything. In this case, for example, if you have SAP uh, as an ERP system, you can include quite a lot uh, in SAP that is quite costly. So most companies tend to uh, put other software in place. Sasvia is an online tool uh, that can uh, currently connect to any data source that is present uh, using also the Kasla library and also with the continuous development uh, making sure that they also keep developing that there is really no database that we cannot uh, access. Nowadays, what we see is we have a programming language. Uh, we have Java, we have Python, we have R. Uh, the programming languages, they are increasing, making it uh, really difficult uh, to know what kind of uh, programming language you need to use. That is why SAUS uh, decided, hey, we have our own programming language, more or less based on Python, but I can also use Python. I can also use R. I can also use uh, SQL. And I can also use drag and drop, making it way more easy to work with the tool and making sure that uh, the coding you write uh, also works. Data um, is, of course, nothing uh, if we do not know what quality is. So instead of just transforming the data and then trust that the data should be okay and base our decisions on uh, that in information, we can ensure that we can check the quality. We can check it internally. We can check it with uh, rules we implement ourselves. We can check it with external sources. So for example, um, I can check if I have 12 months that I don't have 14 months. I can check, for example, with an external da database uh, that I have the correct zip code in a city. So really making sure that the information you are using is accurate. And last, the latest technology. What we see right, right now, there's quite a development in uh, machine learning in artificial uh, intelligence making the tools more and more smart and uh, really increasing the value uh, to the customers uh, who are using it. SAS is currently uh, the market leader in uh, machine learning in artificial intelligence and they invest really billions to ensure that uh, they stay on top. So really what we see now is that uh, it will make our life way more uh, uh, easy that also when we talk about the checks and balances that we need to do, that we can have uh, the tool doing it for us. Can you give an example of that uh, latest technology? Uh... Uh, the most easy example is uh, when we're talking about big uh, the data. We want to understand what is happening in those data sets. Uh, but as a human, how are we going to check a data set of about uh, 10 million lines? We can't. That is where we use machine learning for, uh, that the tool will analyze the tool for us. Uh, it can discover trends, it can discover outliers. It will tell us, hey, this data set looks good. However, the largest invoice is 1 billion. Uh, on average, it is 100,000. That is strange. That is something that is hard for us or time consuming for us to discover. Especially with huge amounts of data, finding the outlier. That's basically what you're telling me. And the smarter the engine gets, the easier it is to replace some of, of our work and, and let us focus on the tax relevant aspects of the data set. And then what we see there, of course, there are uh, quite some uh tools in the market uh, i think uh, that no tool is the solution uh for every question so what we see there uh, we always need to be uh, aware where, where do we want to go do we want to go to a fully 
automated solution or do we want to make a step back and we just want a partially automated solution. So it's really about um, the desire you have that you need to discuss with the software provider or with uh, the uh, provider to see what fits best. What, what, what is the reason uh, for a corporate to choose Alteryx versus SAS VIA, for example? Uh, Alteryx uh, is uh, really a drag and drop, meaning that it is a no, no coding tool. Um, that can be really uh, helpful, but uh, no coding is also limiting let's say really the functionalities. So you need to be sure that uh, when you have really a complex situation that probably a drag and drop uh, will not work. Also, when we look in uh, SaaS, there have quite some good dashboarding. It is all in integrated in one tool. Can be the case with uh, Altrix. However, what we see right now also in the US that uh, SaaS is used in, uh, I think, 80% of the Fortune 500 companies. So it is really designed to handle big amounts of data in really, really short times. You see Alteryx, uh, yeah, so Alteryx is still a good tool, but when you look in uh, the Gartner chart, you will also see that it is still growing, uh, but it's uh, far from being the market leader. And when we look towards the future, uh, with the chart you see on the left, there's more uh, simplified way to show, hey, uh, what do we want to do? It's also what we saw in the previous slides. Uh, we have our database, we have our data warehouse, we have our um, source systems. We need to get data out of those source systems, but that is what we want to do in a really secure manner. We need to transform that data and make sure that, again, in a secure manner, we want to make sure that we make it available to the tools. But of course, if we are talking about a VAT tool, we don't want to send information to it uh, regarding profitability, regarding uh, HR. So it's also there being really smart with uh, data, making sure that we only send that information required to that tool. On the other hand, what we also have is um, we need to make sure that uh, we are compliant, but we also see that rules and regulations can change. We see last year's quite some development. Also making sure that if the information request from any tax authority will change that within Sansphere it is also rather simple to adjust the query, include or exclude data or combine the data to ensure that we make it available to the tool. Yeah, so when we look at uh, APIs, uh, there are of course many ways to uh, connect to uh, source da data. Uh, API is really a, a good one. So uh, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and it defines the call or the request that can be made. So for example, when you go to a restaurant in a time that we could still do it, you get a, a menu. You can order a dessert, you can order main course. What you can't order is meat, pepper, potatoes separately. So the menu is defining the information that you get. That is more or less the same what you have with an uh, API. It is determined the information you have access to or the data you have access to. Data warehouse is really where we have um, a number of databases uh, where we have data available on. Data warehouse, we also most of the time talk about structured data. Think about, for example, uh, Excel files. SQL SSES is a SQL server with integrated services that is really a platform for building enterprise level data uh, integration and data solutions. So there we have really a uh, next step. We can build in SQL, uh, we can have an ETL tool building the basis uh, for our tools. 
file based. Uh, I think that is the most easy one we can work with with a file, um, or we have already have a file uh, available what we can uh, transfer. But it's more about uh, understanding uh, which way we can gather and store data. I think this gives the audience a, a, a broad brush flavor, and some of you might already have made uh, the decisions on 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 uh, what what is between one set of data and one software and the other the connecting uh, the linking pin. So uh, let's move on. Yeah, here the the basically it's the same picture as before, but what what, what we uh, typically are, are involved in is the requirements list. Where where do you as a corporate stand in, in the configuration backend, uh, the data engine analysis, SaaS uh, app performs and the application analysis where obviously between tools um, and, and SaaS VIA that there's a middleware overlap with an ultimate uh, user user interface uh, landing page where you obviously get get can get access uh, all the way down to the backend analysis. So we basically say you need to be able, if you want uh, a, a sound digital transformation project, the, the sequence is uh, you have to have the people, as, as we already outlined, uh, you have to have the, the right uh, set of configuration uh, between IT, finance and tax people. In the ideal world, uh, too, you need to have very predefined processes, and and before you start selecting technology, very important to look at your data architecture, which basically this this is looking into this picture, and and whether uh, a, a lot of uh, in-house uh, corporates are basically first looking at what do we have already. So not let's not look at all sorts of demos of standalone packages but what do we already have um what one of our clients said okay uh, i don't need a, an add-on being a universal universal compliance tracker because i have a planner in my office 365 which i can program as well uh, uh, one of our clients says i don't want a separate software for headquarters because i can program it within sap and, and auto generate the, the service fees I'm charging the whole world uh, for uh, through my SAP, through auto generation, uh, through having um, uh, cost center data being shared in such a way that it, it gets uh, to generate in the company invoices, uh, and and uh, and uh, which includes the allocation keys and the uplift, but also when I click on the in the company invoice uh, for services to my group. A company in Italy, I can click on the invoice in the system, and and that's also what SaaS VI allows you to all go all the way back to the other trail which people were working on this uh, on this invoice, uh, where the services were being displayed and and offered as a charge to uh, to my group company in Italy. So this will uh, show you, let's say. Uh regular company uh, with a lot of di different system and also what you look at that uh, the uh, challenge and really define uh, what is my information re request and for that information request what data do i need and in which system is the data stored If we have defined that, then we can really look at, hey, we know what our backend is. Um, uh, we know what data we want, for example, from uh, SAP. Uh, so there we are going to make a connection to. Uh, every SAP system um, is built uh, in its own way. Um, it, I can have an old uh, system, so I have one client of mine still working uh, on a not uh, as for a HANA system, so really old. So they have a different approach to retrieve the data, uh, slight change in sub for HANA. So I'm going to define per tool uh, my approach on a connector. Uh, what am I going to use as mid middle layer? Will it be a one step? Will it be a two step? Will it even be a three step? really keeping in mind what is the most uh, efficient way to retrieve the data, what is also the most secure way. 
And here is what we really want to see is a uh, make a transparent view of what we have in the back end, how we are going to connect and to which applications uh, the data or enriched data will be sent. So that's more the mapping exercise for SAS via, right? how it interacts with all these uh, source tiers mm -hmm. and applications. Yeah, so when we look at um, what SAS via can, do uh, I can give the most simple answer, and that is quite a lot. Uh, but most of the time, that doesn't ring a bell. So, just to show you, connection can be made through relational databases. Um, it's a long list. Uh, what I've put in here is really uh, the database that most people uh, will know. We have uh, Amazon Web Services. We have Hadoop. Um, so we have quite a lot. Uh, uh, standardized connections within SaaS. The same is for non-relational da databases. If you, connect, uh, if you connect a database like Oracle to SaaS via um, um, on, on your general ledger level, um, Robert, uh, what, 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 what is the game plan there? Is, is, is it a very long process? So the, does it take six months? What, what is a typical uh, size of time I need to think of, uh, of if, if I do a project like that? Um, data connection most of the time uh, really depends on the initial setup uh, from the customer side. So I can do it, uh, let's say within one day, uh, but it can also take me uh, quite some weeks. Uh, I've seen systems uh, where I really advise them to go back to paper. But in general, uh, making that connection, uh, that can be, uh, let's say a couple of minutes. Um, it can also be uh, that first I want to make a filter that I will not import all the data because that can put a large constraint on uh, the connection, but also on the source systems. But that's also something that I can do uh, if I have to write in information in a couple of hours. Okay, so very efficient uh, on average if the if the source tier is is well organized. That's basically what you're telling. Yeah, indeed. And of course, that's also our preference to have a direct connection uh, to a re relational or non-relational database. And when we talk about a non-relational database, means we have to do a little bit more um, to get our data uh, in, in a structured way. Um, that is more included in the initial setup. And that's also something that in the next steps uh, will be automated. Local files. There uh, is also what we can do. So you have on your desktop uh, the Excel file that you want to uh, import. Uh, that can be done in an automated manner that it will search for a specific file name or it will search in a, a specific folder. And that can be any type. It can be Word, CSV, Excel, uh, and still some uh, other files. What we see also is that SAS is used quite some times uh, to connect to SAP. Um, what I always think is important to have uh, the best connection uh, in place, meaning that I don't want to go uh, from, uh, from step one to two to three to four to get the data where I wa want it to be. And that's also why uh, SAS has been developing uh, also together with uh, SAP. Uh, the best connections and uh, stable uh, connections uh, to ensure we have an efficient data gathering. And if we still then have issues with uh, connecting data, then we are going to uh, the cast slip and um, we're really going to use uh, IP ad address and uh, to make it more, let's say, a ma manual job, but then still we can connect to the data. And then what we have been talking about uh, right now is a lot about uh, systems. Um, but what you see quite sometimes, uh, the first challenge starts with uh, being on the same page with the C-suite, finance and control and tax. So we all want to be compliant, but from a different perspective. 
So if we are really on the same page there, then we are going to tell uh, IT, hey, we need this uh, data and we want to see it in this format. IT thinks that they underst uh, understood it in the perfect way. They are going to create a tool. And instead of that you uh, want to receive your BMW, you will get a Chevrolet. That's what you see quite some time in practice. And that is also what we do is uh, making sure that we step in between IT and finance, C-suite and tax. Making sure that we speak the same language as um, the tax people, as the C-suite, as the finance people. So we exactly understand what the request is, what the demand is. With that, we go to IT and we explain to them, probably more in a binary way, uh, what the expectancy is, what they need to do, when they need to uh, deliver. And this really to uh, ensure is that tax team, that C-suite, that FNC is receiving what they have requested. A lot of poll. So what what are what of the factors you fear most? Uh, is that a public country by country on your website? Uh, we, uh, we have some examples in the banking industry, like Barclays uh, has its full CBCR on, on their website. Is it a, uh, the, the, your biggest fear factor real-time assessment by tax authorities on your tax-related data sets? Or is it the lack of support on internal digital projects? Okay, I think it's a sort of clear message, real-time assessment, but tax authorities on data, you are not always able to control. It's sort of the biggest fear. I tend to agree with it, although I guess uh, you should also be worried about the lack of support on, on in, in internal digital pro projects. What, what we see is tax, uh, tax technology budget is not always a clear-cut thing uh, because they people believe it should uh, run um, along lines of uh, the, the the finance budget, and and obviously that that is not how it works because tax has its different features. Um, yeah, the real-time assessment by tax authorities is like the Brazilian system. And I guess a public CBCR like the Barclays example I gave is, uh, is, is sort of a far away view. People are not fearing because on, on most of you being non-regulated, that doesn't apply. You only file it with your um, tax authorities in the headquarters typically. Okay, interesting. Next, uh, next slide. Yes, so. What I want to show you is uh, a little bit about how uh, SAS is working. Um, of course, also uh, regarding the time, I will we'll make it really uh, short. Uh, so what you see here is the main screen, what we have uh, in uh, SAS FIA when we are uh, retrieving a new data set. Uh, so I have my, my available, I can connect to several da data sources uh, or I can Im import from a local one. When I go to uh, the files, is uh, what it will show me uh, what is in a data set. I can see some sample data. And most important, uh, what shows me a lot is uh, more or less an uh, analysis of the data, what, what I have, uh, country, um, but also what I have on cost. Is it unique? Uh, what is my lowest value? What is my maximum value? So over here, I can look at it myself, uh, what I want to see uh, regarding this data. And I can do my first analysis. For example, I see my highest number for months is 16. Then I know for sure that something is wrong. Then for me, the next step is, is that I'm going to prepare my data. Preparing the data is uh, really making sure that I have my complete data creation process. I have my data in, I want to standardize, I want to join, I want to parse. Um, 
next steps, what we will discuss now is I can build a model, uh, I can explore and visualize, and also here I can uh, use the machine learning. So what I have here, when we look at the left, uh, over here I can see I have um, some standard data steps I can take. Uh, I can really uh, do it more or less as a uh, drag and drop. Uh, so I can standardize my text. Uh, I can change uh, columns, convert columns. Um, most important, what you can do is that you can also uh, make sure that uh, you will code yourself. What I mentioned in previous steps, uh, we have here a drag and drop. It's really helpful in standard situations. However, if you want to go more in detail, if you want to implement uh, a standardized step regarding some internal control that, that you want to have, then it's better that you program it yourself. The steps, what you do here, that is what you initially set up. Next step, uh, next time is what you will see is that you can run the same report. You can do it manually uh, or you can do it in an automated way. Um, really to make sure if you have the same data set, you can uh, take the same steps. When we are talking here, uh, gender analysis. Uh, there we already have a little machine le learning uh, based on a name it will tell you if uh, robot is a guy or a girl. So already here, we start with uh, machine learning. We are uh, um, really enriching the data set, uh, really based on the data set. So when we make some changes, we will see really the steps uh, over here. So we have our complete audit trail from the raw data towards the information that we will use for the visualization or the information that we will use to send it uh, to text tools. So I think this really in short uh, is to show you uh, uh, how easy it is uh, really to get from data from a, a data warehouse or from a source data into a tool and making it uh, ready and available for a text tool. Yeah, just in light of time, what we discussed so far is the tech data, data engine to uh, be uh, fully compliant with the tax rules or regulations. Obviously, uh, any delta re you report, you, you need to uh, classify and label as tax risks. Uh, in other words, uncertain tax position reporting uh, for stockholder companies, obviously more regulated than for others. Uh, last but not least, especially on the tax risks, uh, as, as well as on, on being status update on the compliance, are you are you really in control? Is is the tax communication where the last uh, building block is almost the most challenging of all, um, and not only to your to your colleagues but also to the taxman and uh, and the public domain. Okay, if we look on the next slide. This is the Barclays example I was referring to. So Barclays being one of the largest banks uh, has a CBCR reporting in its uh, on its website. Uh, and in this particular case, it did not pay any UK corporation tax, although it paid a lot of other taxes, as you see from these numbers. So this is the full one of the, the fears we, we asked you to comment on the CBCR. This is the public domain version where you need to explain where your data comes from, from source tier to reporting on a website of Barclays in the public domain, sort of the full-fledged uh, visibility. Uh, key takeaways, uh, what are your desired and required tax insights you're looking for? Um, how do you get from source tier to clean data, to tax forms, to XML, to the authorities tax box? And, and the risk reporting to multiple stakeholders as we just saw in, in this slide. And what is the required dashboarding for tax compliance and tax risk? Well, those, these are fairly generic key takeaways. I would say they, they are all applicable and to a large extent fully facilitated by, uh, by SASVIA. Uh, Robert, any final comments you would like to make? I think if um, 
uh, you have any questions, uh, really feel free uh, to contact me or Steve um, so that we can provide more uh, uh, information on really the specific questions or specific uh, situations. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks very much for your presence and staying on board, uh, even though we're one minute uh, over time. There, there will be a taped version on our on our website, so people can look at and share it with colleagues as well. As well as in two weeks' time, we were on another uh, of our webinars on uh, on uh, building blocks for uh, uh, for tax. Uh, as one of the, the 10 uh, webinars and we, we are thereby creating uh, Lego blocks which uh, all through connectors uh, talk to each other. So please uh, uh, be welcome on, on our next event and look on our registration uh, list to uh, register yourself so you won't miss it. Thanks again for today's uh, talk and this will close this uh, meeting of today. Have a nice day.